All right. So let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm James from Chicago Market. I am a owner, volunteer, event team lead. And uh, we've been doing online workshops now for several months and uh, really enjoy offering these a variety of different subjects. Uh, a lot of them food related, but also gardening, uh, other kinds of health and wellness events. And if you're curious about any of our past workshops. Uh, a lot of them are available on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can also go to our blog post, our blog tab on our website, and we do a recap of each one. Uh, so you can also check out, uh, check out video recordings there. So tonight we're doing uh, fermented fruits and vegetables. We have Tamara on from Olardi. And uh, before we get into the presentation, Kate, from Chicago Market is uh, one of our fellow board members is gonna give us just a, qu a quick update, status update of what's going on with the market. And uh, then we'll get into the presentation. It should take about an hour, hour 15 minutes. And um, then we'll have time for question and answer. And um, feel free to use the chat function as we go. Um, if you wanna type your questions in there and um, and we can be sure to cover those. Also wanted to thank everyone who has already made a donation to support this event. And if you haven't yet done so and would like to make a donation uh, to help out Chicago Market and our presenter tonight, I'm gonna to put a link in the chat box. Um, so you can um, feel free to do that if you'd like. We really appreciate the support. So with that, let me go ahead and turn it over to Kate for Chicago Market Update. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, James. Uh, my name is Kate Grimm. I am on the board. I'm also the volunteer coordinator. So if you want to volunteer, um, I'll put my email address in the chat after this. But just want to give you a little um, rundown of what Chicago Market is and what's going on. So um, Chicago Market is a cooperatively owned grocery store that's coming to Uptown. Um, we currently have over 1,900 owners. And these owners probably include several people on this call. Um, but it also includes people and businesses all over the city um, and beyond. Um, we have a lease through CTA for the space at the corner of Wilson and Broadway, um, and it's a really beautiful historic space um, in the former L station. Um, we've recently received all of our go-aheads from the state historical preservation offices, which you'll often hear referred to as SHPO if we're talking on board meetings and such, um, and we're really excited to move forward in this beautiful space. Um, as you may know, um, our feasibility analysis said that this is not only a, an amazing location for the market, uh, but it'll be a great place to support the uptown neighborhood and pre preserve this really beautiful historic space. Um, we're also in the midst of a search for general manager, which will be a huge step forward, and we're really excited about um, all of our potential candidates. And while the store isn't open, um, you can get a quick taste of um, what's coming uh, by going to our shop page online, and I'll drop that link in the chat as well. Um, we have an ever-growing list of locally produced products, including grains, honey, tea, chocolate, um, and we just added bitters from the Bitter X Company, which you uh, may have seen at one of our past pop-ups. Um, our next pickup is March 21st um, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., and if you haven't seen the, seen the space, um, all are welcome to stop by. Just consider it an open house, um, and we usually have extra inventory on hand, so if case, in case you need some honey or some tea, we've usually got that for you, too. Um, we're also starting to the, explore the idea of a farmer's market in our parking lot. Um, and hopefully we'll have more to talk about that in coming weeks. It's kind of a, just a thought in our heads that um, we're trying to wrap our heads around. Um, but overall, the Chicago market is really a place for people who care about sustainability. We care about um, where you know our groceries traveling shorter distances with fewer touch points. And we want to know where our food comes from. And that can be kind of hard in a city like Chicago, which is amazing considering we're a foodie city. Um, it's a place for he people who care about keeping their grocery dollars in the community um, and hiring locally too. Um, one of our farmers who, wor who works with us um, on our shop page, Andy Hazard from Hazard Free Grains, 
campaigns is so focused on lo local that she even sources her cardboard boxes locally. <laughs> um, and like I said before, Chicago market is owned by us and people like you and we want to be open. We will be open to everyone in the community to shop. Um, so consider joining us if you're not an owner already. And if you are, thank you so much. Um, and consider making a donation or leveling up your ownership to the cultivating level. Um, and I think that is about, about it. Oh, and I'm a volunteer coordinator, so please consider volunteering as well. And that's it. Um, I will hand it back to James. All right, thank you so much, Kate. So uh, let's get into tonight's event and I'll turn it over to Tamara to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about what we're gonna learn about tonight. Awesome. Great. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight on um, taking an hour, hour and a half out of your evening to, to join us for fermented foods and vegetables. And thanks, James, for reaching out to organize this event. Um, I'm super excited to share with you uh, a little bit about fermenting and how I like to do it. I like to make things easy and, and quick. So um, I like to share kind of my, my technique for fermented foods. But before I get started, well, first of all, I am in my home. I have a teenage daughter and a dog, and I don't know what's going <laughs> to she knows to be like keep, keeping quiet, but who knows what's going to happen. So we're all used to that, I think, with working from home and Zoom meetings and all of those things, if we can be doing it. Um, but uh, so my name's Tamara Manley. Um, I consider myself self a healthy lifestyle educator, um, a mentor, if you will. I'm a former teacher. I was an elementary school teacher like 20 plus years ago. It seems like a li another lifetime ago. Um, but how I got started on this healthy lifestyle journey and how I started using things like fermented foods was about 18 years ago. Uh, my husband and I, um, we had been married for five years already at that point, and we wanted to have a baby like many couples do. And we were healthy. We were fit. We, you know, blood work was all good, all of the things, and we couldn't get pregnant. And as we went down that journey, um, and learning that there was nothing quote unquote wrong with us, right? It was this unexplained infertility that a large percentage now is, is having this experience. Um, we started to learn that maybe the healthy foods we were eating, the, the, the skim milk and the fat-free rice or whatever it was um, that we thought was healthy, maybe wasn't um, the best route to go. And we didn't make tons of changes overnight. I think we switched to organic milk. I think that was like the big thing that we did. Um, then we maybe went to grass-fed beef, um, but just kind of slowly started to look at ingredients in our food, as well as things we use in our house and on our skin and all of that. And it's been a bit of a journey. Like I feel like you learn one thing and then you learn another, it like opens the door to learning another and another. And I think at that point, if you would have told me I'd be eating fermented food or making fermented food or teaching about fermented food, I would have thought that was crazy because I didn't even know what that was. But as I began to learn about the importance of gut health um, and all of these things, I became really excited about what I was learning, really passionate too about teaching other people. And so um, while switching to organic milk and eating fermented food did not miraculously <laughs> make us pregnant. We still had to use uh, modern medicine for help along those lines. Um, we still want to incorporate as much as we can for a healthy lifestyle and teach our daughter um, tips and tricks and things that she can do to be optimally healthy and pass on as she moves into her adulthood as well. So I am going to show a little bit of slides and then go back to me just to kind of mix it up a little bit. But what I like to do during these workshops is I talk a bit about, I mentioned gut health, so a bit about bacteria and, and bacteria in your gut, because that is a huge, huge part of why many people are choosing to incorporate fermented foods into their diet. Not the only one, but it seems to be a big of the health reason that people are choosing to um, incorporate this into their diet, as well as what fermented foods are, how the process works, and then we'll, um, we can make some things. Uh, I think I put in my PDF either carrots or green beans, but I'll talk more about that. So we'll do like a little demo and you guys, if you want to, can make uh, along with us. Um, and then we will finish it up. And if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat. Okay, share screen. Every time I share a screen, it's like if I'm new to this. That I feel like. All right, here we go. Okay. So everyone can see the slide. Okay. So the bugs in your belly. So I mentioned bacteria. And um, when I first started learning about this, however, like, you know, 10, 12, 13 years ago, 
this was new information for me, but I think many, this is becoming a little more uh, mainstream common knowledge at this point, but our body has hundreds, trillions of bacteria on us, in us, in our digestive tract. Um, your gut, which makes up from your mouth, your whole digestive system all the way through can have anywhere between, you know, two and a half to four pounds to five pounds of bacteria, which is a lot considering that, you know, we can't really like, see, see the bacteria or weigh them. Um, you know, 70 to 80% of our immune system is in our guts. You're, we start to even see that on yogurt commercials now on TV, right? They're talking about eat this yogurt because did you know that it's such and such, you know, 70%, 80% of your immune system lies in your gut. Um, so keeping your gut healthy can be very important for our immune systems. Your gut can act as your second brain. Um, it can produce things like serotonin. It has neurotransmitters. Um, your gut can, a healthy gut can help you get rid of toxins. We have many ways in our body that we uh, process toxins and, and your gut is one of them. And when we talk about bacteria, of course, you know, often we like bacteria, ooh, gross, yuck, but there's like what I call layman's terms, good and bad. Like that's pretty basic, but just there's bacteria that can be beneficial to our body. And then there's, of course, the pathogenic bacteria that can make us sick. But all of that exists along with viruses and funguses and yeasts and all of the things they exist in this microbiome that we have that keeps us healthy. And the science of the microbiome is a whole nother like weekend conference, but it's super fascinating for those of you, I find super fascinating if you haven't started researching or looking into that about how important um, our microbiome is. So the bugs in your belly, the bacteria that is in our digestive tract, in our gut, can do many, many things. They can help you digest your food. They can produce vitamins, particularly B vitamins and vitamin K2. So as the bacteria in our digestive systems process uh, the foods that we eat, and this is true too in the fermented foods, it can produce more vitamins. Um, so very important there. It can help you regulate hormones. And I know um, I just taught a class last week actually on hormones and often as a late 40s year old woman, I think of hormones as kind of the, you know, the, the late 40 year old woman hormone, or we think about them as puberty and teenagers, but hormones are uh, regulating hormones and keeping hormones balanced and healthy is important from baby to elderly. We're constantly um, using hormones for a variety of things. Uh, the bacteria in our gut can help get rid of toxins, as I mentioned earlier, maintain your immune system, balance your intestinal pH, the pH level of your digestive tract, imp improve bowel transit times, right? Every Everybody poops, <laughs> so it can help improve that. Um, increase absorption of nutrients and repair and protect intestinal walls. And I'm not gonna get into leaky gut syndrome for those of you who have heard that, um, but that's a whole another kind of rabbit hole to go down as well. Um, protecting and repairing your intestinal walls, there is like a, where you can get like microscopic holes and like things get into your bloodstream and it can cause all kinds of like autoimmune issues and various problems. So keeping your intestinal walls healthy can help um, prevent and even sometimes reverse certain issues like that, as well as increase the absorption of your nutrients that you're getting. So how does gut bacteria, your microbiome, how does that get all imbalanced? Because these bacteria, these viruses, the fungus, the yeast, all of these things are living in harmony. Like, I feel like it's a song, like they're linking arms and singing a song, but they're living in harmony and they're doing their thing. Well, they can get imbalanced in a variety of ways. And I would say that most Americans have some sort of imbalanced gut bacteria. Uh, by eating a low fi fiber, high sugar, high processed food, nutrient poor diet, the standard American diet, um, overuse of medications, particularly antibiotics. Um, I am a, I am, I have no problem taking antibiotics when I absolutely need to take them. Um, but, and I feel like that's become more um, uh, knowledgeable to not just like throw antibiotics at somebody every time they're sick. But I remember you know, 25, 30 years ago, I would have a sniffle. My doctor would send me home with a Z-Pack, you know, type thing. And now 
that's not what you do anymore because there's uh, more knowledge about the damage of overusing antibiotics and how it can disrupt your, um, well, variety of things, but how it can disrupt your gut biome because antibiotics kill bacteria and you're killing the good and the bad at that point. Um, antibiotics in our foods, so why it's important to choose, especially in animal products, um, organic or organically raised, things that aren't, the animals aren't fed the antibiotics uh, prophylactically, just for no reason whatsoever. So you're not getting those trace amounts, but still, as we're eating things and drinking things all throughout our lives, those trace amounts add up. Um, imbalance gut bacteria from chronic infections. So somebody who's you know chronically ill or constantly getting sick or chronic exposure to toxins. Toxins in our food, um, you know, artificial ingredients and, and preservatives and, and variety of things that aren't good for us in a large amounts over time. But even toxins that we have in our water or um, skincare products, cleaning products, all of those things potentially harmful to us can in, uh, disrupt our gut bacteria. Overusing antibacterial products, the hand sanitizers and the soaps and all of that. Um, of course, right now it's hand sanitizer central, right, with the, with the pandemic, but being mindful of um, soap and water works well too, if we have access to that. So not overusing the antibacterial products. Um, stress, stress can cause, just, just stress can cause your gut bacteria to get imbalanced. Both life stress, which I think for a lot of people, we're going through a stressful time right now, whether it's kids are home or we're home or we're unsure about our, our jobs or finances, et cetera, or other you know, personal relationship stress that might be going on. Um, drinking chlorinated water. So much, most tap water is chlorinated. So drinking chlorinated water can, because chlorine kills bacteria. So drinking chlorinated water can disrupt the gut, your gut biome. Um, as well as uh, having a baby via C-section or formula feeding. And that's not meant to be judgmental or critical. Um, there are babies that need to be born by C-section. And there are times when formula feeding is, is the way that, that people choose to go. But being mindful of that, um, when a baby is born vaginally, they get a microbial bath from the mom coming out that way. Um, and I know a couple of midwives that I'm friends with have talked about sometimes they will take the doctor or the nurse will take swabs of the mom. And when the baby's born C-section, like rub the baby with the, the mom's um, bacteria to kind of help seed the baby a little bit. But just to be mindful of ways to um, adding fermented foods or adding probiotics um, to those situations. Oh, sorry. There we go. All right. So. Who cares? Who cares if there is an imbalanced uh, microbiome? Well, it can be linked to a variety of health problems. And this is just the start. Leaky gut, I mentioned, gluten intolerance, um, insulin resistance, any kind of skin disorder. Whenever I've you know, talked to people with eczema or psoriasis, et cetera, a lot of times it's looking at the gut first. Um, psychiatric disorders, colds and flu, just your general um, immune, immune support, fatigue, Gasp, of course, gas, bloating, constipation, all your digestive issues, headaches, sugar cravings, food allergies, Crohn. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So it's pretty interesting to just even do a quick Google search of gut bacteria or microbiome and insert ailments and kind of see, particularly science articles that science studies and things that come up. It's pretty, pretty fascinating, the whole world of um microbiome and, and gut bacteria and how important it is for overall health and wellness. So how do we balance our gut bacteria? Um, probiotic supplements. Many people like to take probiotic supplements. I'm not a doctor. Talk to your practitioner <laughs> before you do that. But I, I, we like to take probiotic supplements. Um, People ask what brands I recommend. There's so many great ones out there. We, we rotate and you know, we'll get a brand for a few months and then we'll try something else. Rec highly recommended brands. We kind of mix it up because each brand will have different strains of bacteria. Um, I'm not working close enough with the personal health practitioner where I know exactly what strains I might need. So I just kind of mix it up for our family. Um, less stress, which can be kind of a pipe dream sometimes, 
or learning how to mediate that stress, right? Learning how to ex like exercise, yoga, meditation, um, removing ourselves from situations that are stressful or removing ourselves from groups or communities, um, toxic relationships or social media, Twitter feeds or something that can be particularly stressful, um, choosing less processed foods. So eating more whole foods, real foods, uh, foods that are meant to be eaten, not fake processed non-food junk, um, eating less sugar, less antibiotic use. So using, you know, antibiotics as, as you feel needed or your doctor feels needed, but, but limiting that and with the, um, animal products as well. And of course, eating a variety of fermented foods daily. That's a good way to do it. All right, so what are, I must hold my carrots. So what are fermented foods? This one is a leaky, I'm gonna hold this one. It's a leaking, okay, now I'm gonna smell. Um, fermented food, it's a form of preservation that goes back thousands and thousands of years, clearly before refrigeration and canning and all of these modern things that we have. When food is fermented, it's preserved and will last for a length of time. Um, bacteria naturally present on the food begins to break down the sugars and starches on the food, uh, in the food. And as that process happens, lactic acid is released which stops the growth of bad bacteria, keeping the food preserved. Now I have a mason jar here of, of green beans and of carrots. Clearly hundreds or thousands of years ago, this wasn't the way, you know, they might have a, a clay crock that was buried in the ground, um, but the, and they didn't necessarily have the science to know that, oh, the bacteria is eating the sugars and starches and releasing lactic acid. Um, but now that we know more about the science, that's how it's preserved. The bacteria naturally present um, eats the sugars and starches and produces lactic acid, which halts, I'm gonna just move my whole thing here, halts the growth of bad bacteria. So these green beans are preserved, they're not rotten, right? Because if we left green beans on our counter or carrots on our counter, I don't know, for two weeks, that they'd be disgusting, <laughs> they'd be rotten. Um, these are preserved. So if someone asked if fermenting food is the same as pickling. So what, oh, I just answered, I was just talking about this today, um, playing pickleball of all funny things. Um, fermented, fermented foods are a form of pickles, but not all pickles are fermented. Does that make sense? Because <laughs> sometimes pickles are made with vinegar, with acetic acid, and so those aren't fermented. Um, so it's basically two different processes using, um, well, using acetic acid, using vinegar to make pickles, where in the fermenting process, it's producing lactic acid, both somewhat preserved. I mean, with pickles, you sometimes have to can them to keep them for a lengthy period of time. Um, but as far as probiotic and the bacteria aspect and the, the, the living being of the food, the fermented food is the way to go. Um, the person I was talking to today was asking me if pickles were bad. And again, it's all, I mean, there's a million different types of pickles, right? You go to the grocery store and there's pickles with a variety of additives and artificial colors and all of that. I, again, I don't think anything's bad or good because we can all eat some things in moderation. Um, but then there, I sometimes will make just pickles with, I don't know, onions and add some sugar and vinegar and make like a delicious quick pickle, but it's different than fermented foods. So some examples of fermented foods, sauerkraut. Sauerkraut's a very, very common one. Um, we, my family doesn't eat a lot. Of, I like sauerkraut, but I'm the only one. That's why I tend to go more for the carrots and the green beans and things like that. But sauerkraut is a, um, a very common fermented food. Again, we will see jars of sauerkraut on the aisle at the grocery store with the pickles and the condiments. But if it's not, we're gonna be, usually at the grocery store, it's gonna be refrigerated if it's fermented. So the, I don't even know if Vlasic has sauerkraut, but the Vlasic pickles or the Vlasic sauerkraut um, on the regular aisles of the grocery store, those are going to be um, pasteurized. So any bacteria or anything is going to be dead. Doesn't mean it's bad, just not going to have the, the living being in it. Um, I was at Whole Foods this afternoon and they're in the refrigerated section, they have um, sauerkraut that actually is fermented. And you'll see words like fermented, cultured, 
raw, living, probiotic rich. You'll see more keywords like that that kind of clue you in to the fact that it's a live living thing. Kimchi, pickled vegetables, like this. Sourdough bread. Um, kvass, uh, in the middle picture there, there's beet kvass. Kvass, you can make a variety of kvasses, like a drink with fermented, well, in that case, beets, but it could be a variety of fermented vegetables. Beer and wine, kombucha tea. Um, I used to make, we used to make our own kombucha tea and uh, we just moved to this, we moved from the suburbs to the city uh, last summer and we live right across the street from a health food store that has kombucha on tap. So we bring a growler over there like every week and we just fill up our own kombucha so I don't make kombucha anymore. Um, sour cream, yogurt, things like that. Those are all examples of fermented food. And the benefits of fermented food. So... They make uh, eating fermented foods. And in this case, I'm gonna talk mainly about for, uh, fruits and vegetables for the demonstration, but this also applies to the yogurts and the bread and all the other stuff. Um, but it makes the food more digestible. So in the carrots here, as I said, the bacteria is eating the sugars and starches that are naturally existing in the carrot. And here I have onions and jalapeno peppers as well. Um, so it's eating it, it's basically pre-digesting the vegetables. Um, so it can make the food a little bit easier to digest, particularly for people, some people have trouble digesting raw vegetables. It might make them gassy or bloated. And so eating some fer fermented vegetables can make them easier on your body to digest because the bacteria has already kind of started the process a bit. Bacteria, uh, the bacteria in the fermented food can create new nutrients, new vitamins, particularly B and K2, full of good bacteria. That probiotic bacteria can help support the immune system, um, can help curb cravings, especially sugar cravings. And that's for two reasons. One is, um, if you've had fermented vegetables before, you know they're sort of fermenty, I don't know, like a, not sour, not bitter, but there's that like pungent flavor to them. And most of our foods in the United States, so starting from like even baby formula and stuff when we're babies, um, is sweet. Everything is sweet here. Um, unless you search out food that doesn't have a ton of added sugar. So you have you know, even like a lot of store-bought breads and spaghetti sauces and cereals and applesauce and all of the things are sweet, 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 sweet. So we're conditioned to just well, sweet is, is a pleasurable, I mean, who doesn't like some sort of a sweet is like a treat, but we're conditioned to just love and want more sweet, sweet, sweet. So something that is more pungent, more fermenty, can almost come across as bitter and yucky to the, um, to the, the, the palate. That's why sometimes like even yogurt, right? Sometimes someone who's already always eating like sweetened yogurt, you know, fruit flavored yogurt, eating plain yogurt is sometimes not a great experience because it's too, it's too much, it's too sour. So by adding fermented foods um, to the diet over time, and this is really great for children too, over time it can change the taste buds where something really, really sweet may be too sweet. Doesn't mean the person's not gonna like chocolate cake or the ice cream or something on occasion, but it'll just make things taste a little too sweet. So for somebody that has sugar cravings, adding fermented food can be helpful to kind of change the perception of the taste buds. And the second reason it helps with sugar cravings is, as I said, you have bacteria and yeast and, and fungus and all this stuff in our microbiome. Well, what does yeast like to feed on? Yeast likes to feed on sugar. And so when you have an imbalance in all of those things in your body, and you may have too much yeast, um, yeast is like, sugar, feed me, feed me. And so as you eat more fermented foods, take more probiotics, et cetera, to help balance that gut microbiome, it can help not get rid of the yeast because it needs to be there as well, but decrease it to be in more of a, a harmony so that your body is not um, craving the sugar as much. So two great sugar reasons to add fermented food to the diet. The lactic acid that is produced can encourage the growth of the healthy bacteria that already exists in our, in our digestive tract. And what is cool, and I've read different numbers for this, but this is just kind of the average that I've read, is about a quarter cup, so a small serving of fermented vegetables can contain 
trillions of bacteria, um, which is a lot. So if you're taking up even a good probiotic might have 50 billion or you know, 10 billion bacteria units per serving, you can get a lot, a lot, a lot in your fermented vegetables. And you're not going to know exactly how much because you'd have to send them off to a lab, but you get more bang. For me, it's like more, a little more bang for your buck. And I think it increases the flavor of food. I think it tastes good, especially when people get used to the, uh, to the taste experience. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, there we go. All right. All right, so now we're going to ferment. So if you're, for those of you following along that are going to have all my stuff, all right, so in order to ferment, you need a container to ferment your food in. So there's a variety of containers. I like to just use jars, mason jars, old spaghetti sauce jars, what have you. Um, there are fancy crocks. You can get like big crocks, especially for making like large amounts of sauerkraut. Um, we used to have them, but I, when we moved, we had a downsize and I think it's in storage. I don't know where it went. So I have plenty of jars, <laughs> plenty of jars. You can find, um, if you're gonna give something as a gift, you can find those cute like jars with the little, what are they called? Like a flip top lid. It's like a, like a, like it goes like this and they're kind of nice to give to like somebody as a gift, but you need a container. So we have some sort of a jar or a vessel to put the food in. I have to follow my notes so I get totally off track. Okay. All right. Jar. Then you need the food that you're going to ferment in the jar. So I sometimes I will use a funnel. I didn't have to for the green beans, but if it's something like um, sliced carrots, um, things like that, I will use a funnel. Or, so if, if you're following along, if you want to put your carrots or your green beans, in your jar, I pre, the magic of television, I had it already done. So, so we don't have to worry about overfilling it? We just, just That's fill a good it question. Out. So I sort of ran out of green beans, so I have a little underfilled here, but I would fill it to the, just under the, the ridge. Like you don't wanna ever fill it to the very, very top. So all the, the, the part where you twist the lid on, I would just go like below but you can kind of like here. Now, I, for this demonstration, we were doing green beans or carrots just because in my family, those are ones that we eat all the time. And I find that I have many ways to use them as well. And I'll talk about that toward the end. But the food in this jar could be anything. It could be sliced jalapeno peppers. Um, it could be salsa. Take your favorite homemade, salsa recipe that you love and do the same thing that we're going to continue to talk about. It could be carrots and green beans mixed. It could be, um, I like spicy foods. So when I did my carrots, I have onions, jalapenos, garlic, and carrots. It could be Brussels sprouts. Um, mushrooms actually are, are really good to um, ferment as well. It could be berries. It could be a fruit chutney. On my website, and we'll put the um, email in the in the chat. But on my website, we have like a pineapple chutney that's fermented. That's just delicious. A pineapple mango chutney, I believe. Um, it could be berries, raspberries, blueberries. I love to make berries um, fermented, makes them a little less sweet, gives them a little zing, and we'll mix them up with syrup and stuff and put them on uh, yogurt or waffles, that type of thing. And so here's my green beans. So I have my jar, I have my food. And I, again, I like to add, I like to add garlic to almost everything. So I put three cloves of garlic in here. It could be down on the bottom. It could be at the top. It doesn't matter. Um, it could be chopped up or crushed. I just happen to have whole. I have in the past, I have taken several heads of garlic and peeled each one. I have like one of those rollers that, um, peels them really easily. And I've done a smaller mason jar, like an eight ounce or 16 ounce mason jar, just of garlic. And I ferment just the garlic and then delicious to chop up and add to salsa and guacamole and tacos and all that, all that stuff. So I have green beans and I have garlic. 
And now the options here are endless. I mean, if you wanted to add 27 cloves of garlic, go for it. I mean, it, it, it's not baking a cake. You can add whatever you like in whatever amounts you like. We like to add dill because I find it gives us that pickle flavor. If you don't like dill, don't add the dill. Um, you could add nothing or you could add thyme or oregano or chili peppers or basil I find gets a little slimy. Um, that's my only, like sometimes it's like, I'll use dried basil sometimes, but I find basil gets a little slimy. Rosemary, you know, the options are endless. So I just have like a sprig of dill. I just put it in here. But this again, just an example, the world is your oyster with what you're gonna put in here, however you wanna flavor it. Um, and then I also like to add peppercorns, just what I think it tastes good. I just sort of, and for people who like measuring, I don't measure, so just don't <laughs> for this type of thing. Because it's all based on taste, and um, I like experimenting. Sometimes if I add way too much garlic and no one eats it except for me, well, then I know next time to back off the garlic. Or um, I don't know, if something, maybe I added thyme and I certainly really like the flavor, then I know not to do it that time. Um, I like to purchase store-bought fermented foods. Um, I have a slide that has some pictures, but I like to find interesting flavor concoctions. Like today I got one at the store that was a uh, sriracha and jalapeno and garlic, like a sauerkraut. And again, I love spicy and I can't wait to taste it and then kind of figure out how I can recreate it or recreate those flavors with other things. But it's fun to try other things. So does everyone, can I, I'll move on. Okay. So jar, food, okay. How dare someone back off the garlic? <laughs> oh, one little thing about garlic. I don't have an example because none of my garlic did it this time. On occasion, a garlic clove when it's fermented will turn can turn blue, like turquoise blue. It looks very not moldy green, like a turquoise vibrant blue. It's very weird. It has something to do with like the sulfur and interaction, and I can't remember, but Google knows. Um, it's not a bad thing, but it can be a little bit shocking if you see it and it's like a turquoise blue piece of garlic. Ooh, garlic thyme and peppercorn. That sounds good. Okay. Jar food. Okay, salt. Now, when I first started to ferment, I had, um, I don't know if anyone has the book Nourishing Traditions, um, Sally Fallon. It's like a great book about traditional foods. They have a whole section on, um, it's over there, I'll grab it when we're done. It's a whole section on fermenting, but they have also sections on bone broths and organ meats and like just all very traditional foods. And when I started reading it, I was confused because they called for a lot of salt and I would make their sauerkraut or their green beans, what have you. And it was just a lot, a lot of salt. And then I would go to various blog posts and it would be less salt. And I wanted at the time, I wanted a recipe. I wanted like, well, how, what's the right way? And what I began to learn was there's, there's not one right way. Like kind of like, if you like a lot of garlic, put a lot in there or not a lot of garlic. Salt has a purpose for fermenting. Salt can keep the vegetables crunchy because they help remove the water. Um, so it can keep the, the vegetables crunchy. Um, Salt is a natural antimicrobial, so salt can help keep the bad bacteria at bay. There are Facebook groups dedicated to fermenting and all kinds of chat rooms, et cetera, and people will get into arguments and discussions over salt. And I'm a busy mom and I just don't have time to argue about salt. Some people weigh their salt and because of the wanting to keep the brine at a certain um, salinity to keep the bacteria at bay. Some people go wild and use no salt. Use what, as you kind of go through this and ferment on your own and do your own research. If I found some of the heavy salted ones to be entirely too salty for my family's liking. So I backed off the salt. Um, I, my rule of thumb for, for how I make it is for a quart sized jar, I use approximately a teaspoon-ish. Again, I don't really measure normally. If I'm just at home, I'll just take the salt and dump it in. A teaspoon-ish of a good quality sea salt. Um, so I have, for some reason when we moved, 
I only have tablespoons and quarter teaspoons. I don't know why I have like five tablespoons and I have a bunch of, I don't know where the rest of my stuff is. So I'm going to use a tablespoon, but only fill it up like a third. So pretend it's a teaspoon. Like I didn't even know I had so many tablespoons. I don't know what, where it happened to all my other thing. Um, so I just put it in. So pop it in. Because we're going to add some liquid and it'll, it'll dissolve there. But you always want to use a good, well, in general, I feel for, for life, using a good quality sea, sea salt is nice. And this, I don't even, I think this is, is it Celtic salt or salt Celtic salt? I think it's Celtic salt. Some people like Himalayan salt. Ooh, daikon and watermelon radishes. That sounds yummy. I was doing that. Okay, so jar, food, salt. Okay, now. a starter. So now this is again where the world of fermenting gets controversial. Okay. <laughs> is do you use a starter or not? So you can do a wild ferment. You can do a wild ferment. Um, as I said, there is, and it's lactobacillus bacteria is the bacteria that does this whole process. There is that already happening in here. It exists. It's in the jar. It's already on the green beans. It's already on the dill. There's bacteria in here, so you don't have to add any sort of what we call a starter or an inoculant if you don't want to. Um, that's called a wild ferment. I rarely do a wild ferment. Number one is because I, for me, I have found there's a little more room for error. There's a little room for it to go awry, but I have friends, that's all they do is wild ferments. So there's no right or wrong. If I'm going to do a wild and just rely on the bacteria that already exists here, I may add a touch more salt, like just a little bit, just to keep that bad bacteria at bay. So you can do a wild ferment or you can do a controlled ferment. So a controlled ferment is when you add a little bit of bacteria just to sort of jumpstart or start the process. So one of the ways to do that is, this is way I strained yoga, plain yogurt. I just put a strainer and um, strain the yogurt. And this is just liquid whey. If I wanted to, I could add, I'm not going to just for this, I'm just gonna pretend, I would add like a, a couple tablespoons or so of liquid whey to here, because there's a lot of lactobacillus bacteria in this. And the reason you strain it is because then it gets rid of the milk solids, the yogurt, because the yogurt wouldn't go so well with that. You can also purchase, there, and this is just one brand, there's a variety, um, a starter culture for making fermented raw vegetables. This is essentially bacteria in little packets. <laughs> it's, just like, it's like a little powder. I tend to go this route. This particular brand has a variety of lactobacillus plantarium. I can't read it all, but it has a variety of lactobacillus bacteria strains. Um, I have found each of these different boxes, different brands, they'll have different guidelines of how much to use. And this is just what I have found to be true. I have found that some of the directions tell you to use a lot, like a whole packet per quart. And I find, I have found that to not be necessary. That's just my personal experience because technically we don't need this. Technically the bacteria is already living here. Um, and these aren't, it's not super cheap. Um, so I just like to use like a quarter teaspoon or so of the, of the powder. And it's, well, I'll just pour it in here. It's like a little, you know, it's like a little, I'm going to spell my computer. It's like a little powder, like a little beigey beigey powder. You could also, if you have probiotic capsules, this would be a little more expensive way, but if you're just starting and want to try, you don't want to like buy anything and you don't want to strain yogurt, or maybe you don't eat yogurt, so why would you buy a thing of yogurt just to strain it? If your probiotic capsule has lactobacillus bacteria, it will either say that, or it'll say LB period in some long name. You can open it and put it in there. Um, I tend to go Oops, this route. I tend to go with the starter culture. Um, again, I have friends that use nothing. I have friends that use whey. I have one friend that would use whey all the time and then she moved. And for some reason, when she would use whey, her ferments always molded. 
I don't know, like the stuff in her air in her new place. I have no idea. So it's really kind of up to you about what you would like to use. So I use about a quarter teaspoon of the starter. So we have jar, food, salt. If you're doing a wild ferment, you would skip any sort of starter. If you're using whey, you would just a couple take like a couple tablespoons or so. Okay, I'm moving that around. All right, and then we got it. okay. And now the last step is a liquid. Oh, um, start. I do about a teaspoon of salt in a quart. Um, I have found that to give a nice crunch, give a successful ferment without being overly salty. Some people like to do more. Um, I have found some recipes to call for a tablespoon per quart. I find that to be incredibly, incredibly salty. Um, so it's sort of a teaspoon plus, a teaspoon and a little bit, I found to work per quart. Salt is important to keep the bad bacteria at bay um, and it keeps the, the vegetables crunchy. So the last step we need, we have, is we need to cover this with a liquid, and usually it's water. Um, usually it's water. Uh, you could use a fresh juice. Like if I have done it before, when I get out my juicer, I find the juice, the whole cleaning of the juicer is a thing. But um, I have done like fresh celery juice and use that. Um, it adds a nice kind of an additional layer of flavor, but just a good filtered water. I hope I have enough water. I don't think I do. Okay. Need a little more water here. Okay. In the water, you want to whatever liquid you're adding, you want to fill it up to that that um, lower rim because you want to leave room for gases and air and bubbling. Like that. And then, where's my lid? I don't have one. Well, I guess I could. If I had like a knife or something, I might like, you know, squish it down to get the air bubbles, um, mix the salt. Sometimes I just cap it and shake it. And then see, I do need to then add a little more water because as it filled in. Okay. Yes, and someone said they when they the strain yogurt. Um, once you strain the whey, it makes like a nice cream cheese. Um, that's what I have in the, I have the, yo the strained yogurt in the fridge. And later I'm going to add uh, probably dill, garlic, and kind of chives and stuff and make like a nice cream cheesy substance for, for things. Now. Okay, so depending what you're doing, like I have, my hands are clean, but if you are putting your fingers in here, you want to make sure your hands are, you've washed your hands. Um, but some, I have like a little bit of green bean, a little bit of dill kind of poking up here. Once they've been submerged, they're covered. Like you don't have to be, a, you want it to be covered with the liquid. Sometimes like things like mushrooms will really float to the surface. You can use if you want, if you're having something that's floaty, you can use weights to weigh it down. There's glass weights that are actually for fermenting. They're, um, they're just these like little discs, like um, Amazon like fermenting weights. We'll pop them up. You could use some people use like a uh, like a river rock that they maybe boiled in water to sterilize, kind of that will fit in the jar. Um, if you're using anything with cabbage, you can like a a leaf of the cabbage. You can use the leaf to like shove it in there to use that as a weight. You don't have to use a weight. Uh, some people use like a little Ziploc bag with marbles and shove it in there. Totally up to you. I, I wouldn't really need to with this. This is pretty covered with the with the liquid, but I'm just gonna put it in here to demonstrate. Just kind of stick it in there. And like a little garlic piece floated at the top, but that's okay. And then you cap it. That's it. And you don't have to cap, I can just cap it. You're not like squeezing it tight or anything like that. Um, just a normal lid. Uh, and what you do is you set it then out on your counter at room temperature. I mean, if you wanna put it in another room, you can. I just tend to keep it on my kitchen counter. At room temperature, five days, seven days, 10 days. This is where 
the process can be not, not frustrating, but there is, again, it's not, a, it's not a full, full recipe because fermentation happens with the strength of the bacteria, the temperature in the home. So the warmer, the faster it will ferment. Um, right now, our condo is pretty cold. Well, it actually felt warm today at 40 degrees, but this past week it's been like freezing in here. Things took a lot longer to ferment. Um, I don't anymore, but when I first started, I would write the date, like February 23rd on the lid, just so I, I'd forget. It would be sitting on the counter and I'd totally forget about it. Um, and I like to put plate or a cookie tray or something because you will sometimes have liquid escape. Um, for the carrots, I used one of these plastic mason jar lids and they don't do a seal. So as I was moving it, it was like spilling all over my hand. Um, but you will have sometimes liquid escape and it's fine if it gets on your counter, it's just a mess to clean up. But I find if you have it on a tray, it keeps that um, contained a bit. I had once I made like four or five jars of kimchi. This was like years ago. And it had the dried shrimp powder and the ginger and the chilies. It was very, very, very pungent. And I had just set the five jars on the counter. I did not put them on a tray. And it was the same day. Like they were fermenting really, really quickly. And that night, middle of the night, we at the time we were in a different, I was upstairs in bed. I woke up smelling the kimchi all the way upstairs. <laughs> and at first I thought I was dreaming. And I was like, what happened? I was like, oh no, the kimchi. <laughs> I run downstairs. Well, it hadn't exploded or anything, but it had, it had leaked so badly out of all the jars that there was this huge puddle of kimchi juice on the counter, down onto the floors, and of all things, like very pungent, very pungent. <laughs> um, so I learned, it was a big mess. And so I learned to keep it on a tray. Someone asked, do you have to burp the jars? That's a great question. So as you set it out on your counter, so these are the new green beans that I just did. And here's the ones that I've already fermented. These have been sitting out for about a week. Because as the bacteria eats the sugars and starches in the food, releasing lactic acid, it also releases gas. And that's kind of why the liquid will ooze out sometimes. The recommendation is to burp the jars. Some like once a day as you go by, burping would just consist of bloop, just you know letting the gas out. Um, if you've had a lot of liquid le leakage, and let's say the liquid has gone down here, you want to keep the, the vegetables covered, just add water, just add filtered water. Um, I honestly don't always burp my jars because I just forget. So technically, ideally, yes, burp the jars every day. Um, if you forget, then you don't burp them. <laughs> Sometimes you just might have a little bit more of a liquidy mess. Um, I personally, knock on wood, I've never had anything explode or anything like that. I've just had liquid leaking out of, of the jar. You will, I've already opened this because I wanted to taste it. Um, you will have, because of the gases, sometimes the lid will be pressured, like it'll, it'll be firm to the touch. Um, when you open them to burp or to taste, you wanna open it carefully. I've already opened this, but you wanna open it carefully because sometimes the gas, it will just not explode, but just psh, and, and make a little bit more of a mess. Do you have to shake it daily? I don't shake it daily. You could, it wouldn't hurt, but I don't. Um, so how do you know when it's done? You learn to tell, <laughs> like over tell, like anything, right? You kind of, the more you do it, the more you learn. But when you're just starting, um, you will start to see a color change. Generally, the liquid gets more cloudy. You will see, I think the carrots. I find like once I jostle it, the, well, I don't know if you can see it on the Zoom, but there are bubbles rising in here, almost not quite like champagne, but almost like a, like a soda, like a, like a lightly ferment, like a lightly carbonated experience. You'll see bubbles sometimes if you give it a little shake. The, um, the brine becomes cloudy and really just let taste be your guide. So after four, five, six days, if it looks like it's doing something, it's getting bubbly, it's getting changing color, getting a little cloudy, open it carefully, get a clean fork or a clean knife or tong, whatever take out a piece and taste it. And if it tastes like 
a raw green bean with a little bit of garlic, you might want to let it ferment a little bit longer. If it tastes like a sour pickle experience, then it might be done. If you want it to go longer and become more acidy, more fermenty, if you will, then just cap it back and leave it out for another couple of days. Ferments should taste sour, but not rancid. Um, when I first started fermenting, I was like, you gotta be, I'm gonna put something and leave it on my counter for a week. Like, are you kidding? That's how we poison ourselves and die. <laughs> like that sounds crazy to me. Um, but we've all had the experience with milk that has gone bad in the refrigerator or something that it, you get it close to your face. You couldn't, people would have to pay a lot of money for you to even taste it. Like your, your body has a repulsion to it. Fermented food is more pleasantly sour. Um, it may be a different sour experience for you, but it won't be repulsive and rancid. So you will know if it's, if it's well, it rarely goes bad, but you will know if a ferment goes bad. I've had a ferment go bad twice. Once I did not put my lid on right. It was all like cockeyed and I just think it had like too much exposure to the air. The other time, I don't know what happened, but the one time that I had the lid on wrong, there was actually like... Um, like insects, like there was like, like fly larva. Like it was clearly, it was, there was, if you see insects on it, it's gone bad, don't eat it. Um, sometimes people will, if it's gone bad, you'll find like a furry, like a mold, like a green or black mold. Don't eat it, throw it away. I have had some people that scrape it off and they just go, I'm like, it's a jar of green beans. Like it's not like a million dollars. Just, I, I like to err on the safe, better safe than sorry. Um, if there's a white film, that's okay. That's like a byproduct of the fermented process. Sometimes we'll see, actually I'm gonna turn back before I spill it. Um, there was a little bit of a white film on the green beans, but then when I tasted it, it kind of sunk to the bottom. I don't know if you can see, but there's kind of like some white sediment down here. That's okay. Um, but anything we've all done, like moldy bread, like we've all seen that. So if you have any of that experience, just get rid of it and start again. Um, let's see, when you're when it's finished, when you decide, hey, this is delicious, I would like to stop the fermenting. Um, pop it in your fridge. When you store it at a cool temperature, thirty. The general refrigerator temperature, it slows down the process. It doesn't stop the process, but it slows it down. So it will keep it there for a long period of time. Some people might have a root cellar or something like that, but for most people, you just put something in your refrigerator. Vegetable ferments will keep six plus months. Um, we tend to go through this kind of thing fast, but if I have a big jar of just fermented garlic, that may take a little bit longer to get through. So six plus months, it just kind of slowly um, just ferments and gets, but slowly, slowly. Fruit, if you're fermenting fruit, it's more sugary. It won't last quite as long because it will eventually turn to alcohol um, a couple of months in the fridge. But we find in our house, anything fruit fermented, we eat it so fast. We've never even got it past like a couple of weeks. Um, what else did I go on? Oh, good question. Reuse the brine. Yes, you can absolutely reuse the brine. So, um, I mean, there are places like some health food stores and Whole Foods and stuff that will sell gut shots that are literally the liquid from fermented vegetables as a, a health shot drink. So you can um, save the brine. You could even use the brine as a starter. So if you're making the, you know, the new green beans, you could pour some of the, you could really I could pour it from the carrots in here. You just want to make sure the flavor profile matches. So if you had a lot of garlic and you didn't want garlic, you know, then you wouldn't use that brine. But the brine is great. You could drink it. You can add the brine to um, uh, salad dressings. You can use the brine as like a vinegar for your salad dressings and jazz it up that way. Um, the brine's really, really, really good. I just like to drink it sometimes. Just shoot it. Same process with fruit, same process with fruit. Um, yeah, and I'll put the, um, my website, I'll put it down here. There's tons of recipes. There's like a whole fermenting section um, with tons of recipes. The berries are in there, do the same process. Sometimes I add a little sugar because I find um, the fruit is so heavy in sugar, but it, it gives a little so that they're not too, too sour. 
just for my, just for our family, but this, the same process. So if this was like that, like a pineapple chutney that I was talking about, fresh pineapple chutney, whatever awesome recipe you have, same process. Starter, if you want a little bit of salt, some sort of a liquid um, for fruit, you could even use like the fruit juice type thing. Yes, five to 10 days for vegetables. Fruit will ferment faster. So um, one, two, three days type thing. In the summer, sometimes I find fruit will ferment like within 24 hours. Do, do me and my family have one favorite? I really like to ferment salsa because we eat a lot of salsa. So I just take, I don't even use the same recipe every time, but I'll just take a good homemade salsa recipe you know, chop it all up or puree it all up in the thing and then put it same process. Um, we do, I love jalapeno peppers. Um, I like the spicy. So I'll do jalapeno peppers. We chop them up. Um, I used to, when my daughter was younger, I don't as much anymore because she doesn't eat as much food that she wants ketchup to use with ketchup, but I would ferment ketchup. Um, especially when she was little, I would get a, either a good homemade ketchup recipe that wasn't too weird because she, you know, if it had too much weird stuff, she wouldn't eat it. But I would get a good homemade ketchup recipe, add a little, sometimes I would even just add a little brine from a, and then ferment the ketchup or even a good organic ketchup, like even Heinz organic, you could squeeze it all out in a small mason jar, add a starter or add some brine and ferment it that way. And someone asked seeds or no seeds with the peppers, up to you. <laughs> I do all the seeds because I want all the, all the spice. So that's totally up to you. Um, and then how to use fermented foods. Well, clearly you could just eat it. <laughs> it's just put, and they're meant to be a, con a condiment, a side dish, especially when people are just starting out or if they may have um, an imbalanced gut, eating half a jar of fermented green beans may send you to the bathroom for, for a bit of time. It may just be like, whoa. So it's meant to be more of a condiment. So uh, you know, we might serve, I don't know, a spoonful or something with our dinner. Um, but I like to also chop things up and put them in salads. So a great way too to introduce fermented foods to people who aren't really on board is chop up some fermented carrots or fermented green beans, fermented radish, what have you, add it to your big green salad, toss with your favorite dressing. Um, you can add the fruit to smoothies. You could use um, some of the liquid, add it to some sauce, even like barbecue sauce, things like that. Just little ways to like infuse it with some probiotic rich goodness. Um, I love chopping up fermented vegetables into um, hearty salads, like egg salad, tuna salad, those types of things. Um, adding them to a wrap, adding them to jazz up guacamole, salsa, even store-bought, you know, um, just to jazz up the flavor a little bit. Um, drink drink the, the, the liquid. Um, and then I did wanna share, if you are buying store-bought, I'm not sharing. These are some of these are some of the brands I buy a lot just because I see them a lot. Um, oh, here's the gut shot. Um, there's other brands too, but that's just the liquid from fermented. But the Bubby's pickles, this wild brine. I get the farmhouse cultures a lot. That's the sh the Sriracha one that I just bought the, the today. Um, but and I, I love that you can now find. I mean, it's so cheap and easy to make. But I like that we can find fermented vegetables at almost all grocery stores now because it just makes it easier sometimes if you don't want to make it or um, if you're traveling, you know, you want to have it in your you know, VRBO or what have you. Um, so yeah, so that, so for everyone who has made their thing, you leave it on your counter, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 days. Um, burp it if you want, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and give it a taste. And I'm happy to answer any other questions or that's all I got. Oh, thank you so much. We do have a couple of questions from earlier in the chat. So yeah. maybe I'll just ask you those. Uh, someone asked about using flavored salts. Oh, okay. Uh, should, is that uh, an option or should we stay away from those? I've never done that, but I, I, if, I mean, I'm, it's, I'm sure it's a good quality flavored salt that has like good flavorings. I, I wouldn't see why it'd be a bad thing. I think it could add an interesting flavor, but I've never tried it, but now I want to. <laughs> so somebody try it. <laughs> uh, 
All right, uh, another question going back to the wild ferment. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little more about what, what the possibility is for uh, bad bacteria to begin to grow or what, what else could go wrong with a wild ferment? I have just had, well, some people only do, and really clearly, historically, wild ferment was the way to go, right? I mean, that's how nobody was, you know, hundreds of years ago buying, buying things or straining yogurt to add bacteria to the mixture. So wild ferment is the traditional way of fermenting foods. Um, I have just found if we don't know how much bacteria is on these green beans, right? Like maybe we washed them in too much, we soaked them in chlorinated water, who knows? Um, I have just found sometimes I get like more mushy vegetables or the two times, actually the two times I did get it go wrong, um, I did a wild ferment, but I have done wild ferments have been successful. Um, so it's really up to you people. I just find if I'm gonna go to the effort of chopping and doing and sitting on my counter and sometimes spilling and making a mess, then I want to have a good product at the end. I want to have a product that we can eat at the end, but it's totally up to you. Traditional ferments were clearly wild. I mean, that that's the way to go. I just find if I can add a little bit um, of a, just a little zhuzh to get it going, that just makes me feel better. <laughs> but you can also add this to the liquid from a previous ferment too. I forgot to mention that when we were talking about the starters. Yeah, I actually, uh, on the starter question, I was wondering if you could have any tips for straining yogurt. Um, yeah. I'm having a little bit of problem extracting the liquid from the yogurt that I bought. Okay, let me see. I have a slide here I did not show. So I've just done it this way, basically, with the jar. Um, and I set it out... Sometimes it takes a while, like this yogurt I set out for hours and hours and it, um, like at first it didn't seem like anything was happening. And then I looked and actually I didn't even use a cheesecloth cause I don't know where mine is. So I have a strainer that doesn't have, it has a, it's a very uh, fine, fine mesh strainer. So it didn't have big holes. Um, sometimes if you get Greek yogurt or already strained yogurt, it's already been strained. So it's not going to have a lot of liquid whey. I bought a yogurt that was new to me and I was it was like a Bulgarian yogurt. I just grabbed it and I was like, oh no, is this already strained? But it turned out it had quite a bit of whey. Um, so I sometimes even overnight, like setting it in your fridge, you'll get some liquid, but you don't need a ton. You just need a tablespoon or two. So sometimes even floating on top of the yogurt, you know, you might have enough liquid to just kind of pour, pour in there. Um, and plain yogurt is clearly best only because if you have flavored yogurt, you're gonna be adding the flavor to your, but although flavored yogurt way for berries could be really good, but I think like strawberry yogurt would be weird with the green beans. James, we got a, um, like a little cheese coffee kind of like bag with like- Oh a yeah. It actually, I think came with a cold brew coffee kind of makeup. <laughs> um, but we just put a bunch of yogurt in that and then just like literally squeezed oh, it. Oh yeah, okay. Oh cool. Bring it out. Yeah. You've got something that's, I think, a thin enough fabric or like a, a tight enough weave. Yeah. It's probably fine. I but would think even like a white, like those thin white, like bar towels, those like thin, um, you know, what I'm talking about like flower, flower sack cloths or something. Um, yeah. Cause I feel like I've done that before. I've done that before too, where I've taken it and I've squeezed it and strained it to get out the, the rest. I like that little, that contraption you have though. That's cool. We had to do it earlier. So we had to go forcefully to get it. <laughs> Couldn't wait for it to drain on its own. All right, other questions? You can feel free to type them in the chat or if you wanna unmute and ask your, qu your question, you can feel free to do that as well. Not so much of a question as a, um, I wasn't able to to get all the stuff to 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 work with you today, um, but this has really opened my eyes to like it's so easy, and we would be eating this stuff all the time if we were doing this. Like we love this type of food anyway, um, and the fact that it's so simple. Um, yeah, it's just great. I want to, and when you said salsa, I was like, that blew my mind. That blew my <laughs> mind. <laughs> Completely. 
So thank you. It's You're just it's fantastic. Awesome. Yes, and it is simple. And that's what I, and I think, I think it can be made complicated in some books and some websites, um, but it can be really simple and you can make whatever, whatever you want, like whatever. And I like, well, that's like, I can't wait to dig into these carrots with the jalapenos and the onions. You can make out whatever flavor profile you want. Fermentation station. That's awesome. <laughs> I'll show off our daikon and watermelon That's pretty. and carrots in too, because we had some extra carrots as well, so. Oh, that looks beautiful. What kind of uh, flavoring did you put into that? That looks, I was just speaking of daikon as you, as you brought it up, but daikon and uh, those fruits. So how would you, what would you just let it ferment or did you add a flavor? The, the watermelon is watermelon radish, actually. Oh, watermelon radish, okay. Green on the outside and the pink on the inside. Oh, sure. And what's the, what's the orange? Is that uh, carrot? Yeah, we had extra carrots, so we just like three small carrots. Okay, that, yeah, fantastic. But the watermelon radish, when we tasted them, are so peppery that we didn't put any peppercorn in it. Ah, yeah, they are. They are. They're wonderful, but they're, they're, they're real radishy. Really yeah. radishy. Yeah, they're I pure radish. Them. Oh, I love that. It has Ooh. a lot more a potential for adding lots of flavor to it because it's a little bit more plain. So mm -hmm. interesting to see how it works out. We have um, some garlic. garlic in there and that's it, really garlic. Okay, yeah, well, the radish is gonna be very radishy. Yeah. And the daikon can, can have it, will pick up the flavor. That's wonderful. I need to copy so that, pretty. that's fantastic, thank you. It looks so pretty too. It looks like really watermelon radish looks so pretty in the jar. Yeah, has Dana, anyone else fermented? Has anyone else fermented anything that's been in the past that's been really interesting? Always. No? I've had fun doing, I've made kombucha. Mm, I like making kombucha. All the different uh, fruits you can add to your second ferment, you know. My husband did sauerkraut recently to try that out, so. And this was clear or like green cabbage, wasn't it? Green cabbage. I actually think there might be so I can't remember what is green cabbage. Oh, and it's on you, there. You did a little bit of red cabbage too. Oh. Oh, he also did some radish in here, but like coriander and mustard seed and stuff. Ooh. Give it some of that kind of flavor. So we've been adding this to salads. When you said salads, I'm like, yes, I love that. Adding it to salad is great. I like adding it top of eggs too. Sometimes they have eggs. In them. Ooh, that's a great idea. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The sky's the limit. You can really like ferment anything. It's fun. Well, this was fun. Yeah. Well, everybody, please take pictures of, of your creations. We'd love to have those for the uh, Chicago market Instagram account and we'll, we'll tag Olardi as, as well. Um, so if there aren't any more questions, I just really want to thank uh, Tamara, for your time. And um, we had a lot of fun tonight. And please uh, look forward for our next workshop. We don't, we don't have our next one posted yet, but um, probably around the end of March, we'll do another online workshop. So uh, with that, thank you again. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your evening. Awesome. Good night, everybody. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. You, thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Corey.